Hi, I'm Dominic. I work in the layer team in Blink, uh, together with my colleagues uh, in different places in the world. Uh, I apologize, my voice is a bit damaged. I hope it's going to last for 30 minutes. Um, you, you'll find out. Uh, today I'm going to talk a bit about recent improvements in uh, text and layout in Blink. So what's on the agenda for this uh, talk? I'm going to talk about goals and challenges of like what, what we do in text and layout in, uh, in a layout or in a browser engine in general. What, uh, does, <coughs> what kind of tasks and responsibilities does the font code have? And then actually talking about these recent improvements and future plans. I think it helps a little bit to understand what the font code does and give everybody a brief update on that um, to understand the, the, the work a bit better. So challenges in text and layout, and this is an incomplete list. Um, first, there's, there's sort of the complexity and dependencies of it. Um, complexity is introduced by all the ways you can use in CSS to, um, to style font and text in the browser. Uh, the dependencies come from interacting with the platform's font, uh, or the available fonts on the platform, um, libraries you use on different uh, on different platforms like Cortex, uh, FontConfig, FreeType uh, on Linux, uh, FreeType and um, not FontConfig but like Android's own font selection mechanism on Android. And so these dependencies we deal with on different platforms. Um, then optimal font matching and fallback. So this is a difficult task also because it's very performance sensitive. Like when the page doesn't specify the right fonts, you have to sort of do the best for the user, so find the right fonts so that you can still display something and not just sort of not define blocks. Um, shaping non-Latin languages, um, and we'll come to that in more detail, um, is also a sort of, can be a difficult problem, it can also be a performance issue. Uh, vertical text, uh, so accounting for, <coughs> accounting for different writing systems. Um, yeah, and at the same time, we always want to keep good performance with that uh, and uh, enable, ideally, all uh, typographic features. And you guys are talking about, for example, uh, kerning, just to mention one of them. So goals of text and layout, to, to recap, we want to have correct and consistent display of text in all languages, uh, high performance of complex text processing, and low overhead and cost for advanced typographic features. And before we come to the improvements in that area, uh, let's look into what does the font code actually do. And it does mainly three things. It does measure text, it does draw text, and it, it uh, helps with selecting text. <coughs> so let's get into measuring. So maybe intuitively one would think the length of a piece of text is dependent on the font that's selected and the size of that font and the text itself. But it turns out this equation is a little bit longer. Um, so it does not only depend on the font and the size, but also on the direction, on um, typographic features, the script of the language, that's like the writing system, uh, and the language and context not only the actual text that, that you're looking at, but also the text around it. Um, now we're going to go through these and look a bit at each of these uh, variables of that equation. So the font can be something like times, source sounds, or lobster. <coughs> that is quite a familiar concept, I would say. Uh, then, of course, the size of the font is also relatively simple. Then the direction. Uh, languages written from left to right, right to left, top to bottom, and I think bottom to top is here just for the sake of completion. I don't think actually there is a language that practically uses that. Top to bottom, however, is common, for example, in um, Japanese typesetting. So yeah, this is, this is important to sort of look at because um, the letter spacing, for example, in vertical layout is different than in horizontal layout and where you draw the actual glyphs. Um, features, open type, which is the uh, like one sort of widely accepted standard for 
for font files has a couple of features that can be activated and, and sort of deactivated in the CSS. So features are like small caps, ligatures, swashes, and ornamentals, and variations in number <coughs> of And then um, the next variable here is script. So the script is the writing system that a language is written in. So several languages can share a writing system, so can share a script. But the other way around, several languages, or like one language, is, can, one language can be expressed in, um, sometimes in multiple scripts. So just a few examples here are Latin, Arabic, Hiragana, Cyrillic, traditional and simplified Chinese. And uh, common is also a variable for um, a script. So common means, for example, characters like punctuation characters have common script. And that means they are sort of, they need to be resolved with adjacent scripts or the, the um, sort of surrounding text. And um, language, so as I mentioned, there is this kind of end-to-end <coughs> um, -end relationship between languages and scripts. So English, German, Finnish can be are usually expressed in Latin. Uh, Azerbaijani can be expressed in Cyrillic, Latin, or Arabic. Um, and Chinese as a language can be tra uh, expressed in traditional or simplified um, script or Chinese script. And then we look at context or text and context. So if I want to measure head of word out of this block of text, for English, it's rather easy. Like if I um, want to measure this hello world, I can take the length of this without looking at the context. Now, looking at this piece of uh, Arabic, um, if I want to measure the length of this, I cannot ignore the context. If I remove the context, this text, <coughs> this text needs to look like this. For the for reasons of the shaping rules of Arabic, so if you observe the difference again, this middle part becomes actually longer if you ignore the context. So this is very relevant for doing layout in the browser, for example. Where do you where do you break this piece of text and so on? And when you're doing length measurement, you cannot ignore the context. So the next responsibility of the font code is drawing text. And for this, we need to know uh, the length already. So we need to know already also where the text gets placed. For drawing text, again, we're looking at this, uh, this Arabic example. Um, we need to have like a starting coordinate where, um, where this piece of text gets drawn. And then we need horizontal advances for each glyph that's picked from the font. <laughs> now in this example it's just sort of horizontal advances. So we we have like a starting coordinate and then we're just moving to the right. Because we're drawing from the right, even though this is kind of red from the uh, we're drawing from the left, although it's red from the right. Now here we have a different example. We have um, like Latin characters, but they have combining marks. So we um, have a Latin small letter E with a <coughs> combining cedilla and brev. I forgot which one was which. Um, cedilla is low. This one, yes. yes. Right. <laughs> um, and then we have a, a letter small letter A with a ring below, and we have a, a modifier letter small e. So there are different, different fonts uh, that handle this differently. In some fonts, the whole glyph exists, and in some fonts, they have the small letter E, and they have something like a placeholder here for putting the <coughs> combining marks. So we need to drop know um, where is each of these actually drawn. So let's say we have a font where each of these are sort of individual glyphs. Then we need to find out where to place them. If this is our starting, starting coordinate for drawing this piece of text, we need to know, okay, we place the E here, we place one combining mark here, and we place one here, and so on. Like for this A, we place the combining mark, like this, this um, circle below, we place it there, and we need to know that this one actually goes there. Because this E can be a sort of scaled version of this in the font as well. 
And uh, the last important role of the phone call is selecting text. Well, selecting text is rather a familiar concept, I would say, as well. Basically, it means the translation between character position and screen coordinates. So if you drag your mouse cursor or with the touch gesture over a piece of text, then you want to identify, okay, <clears throat> I'm selecting, um, so you're sort of visually drawing over the glyphs here, or you're dragging over the glyphs here, but what we need to translate it to is character position. And um, while in Western languages it's usually easy, it's that glyph position is usually identical to character position, or often identical. In, um, <coughs> in Arabic it's not necessarily identical, and, um, or in other languages where multiple characters are combined into one glyph, it's not necessarily identical. So we have this selection text, uh, the font code uh, is responsible for doing this translation. Where is the cursor and what does that mean for the character position? So we have these three roles, measuring text, drawing text, and selecting text. So I already mentioned that for this example with the EAE and the different combining marks, we need to find out where do these combining marks actually go. And this process is called shaping. So from an input text or from an input character sequence, you, you generate glyph buffer, um, a glyph buffer data structure which holds this information about where does each of these individual glyphs go in relation to a uh, starting position. And also, shaping is the process of looking at a character sequence in a language that requires, um, <coughs> well, in a language that's usually called like a language that requires complex text processing. From looking at a certain character sequence, <coughs> you do the glyph selection so that this is actually gets shaped into correct Arabic and is not just a sort of um, sequence of individual um, glyphs that are incorrectly selected. In Arabic, each glyph has like three forms, a, a sort of initial form, a medial form, and a terminal form. So um, you need to figure out by looking at this uh, character sequence, do I need to select a medial form or an initial form, for example. So now traditionally in uh, in Blink and in WebKit, um, there's two code paths, and I think it was introduced as a, originally introduced by Apple as a, a optimization of not having to put everything through code text for complex processing um, because it can be slow. Um, now that brings about a lot of code complexity, and also it brings about um, some subtle bugs. <coughs> So um, if, you, if you send the same Arabic text to the simple code part, you will end up with something like this. And these are all the sort of isolated forms of these um, Arabic uh, characters. <coughs> so they are not joined. You don't have this kind of nice continuous flow <coughs> of the, of the uh, visual appearance. And this is sort of incorrect. And you sometimes see it on signs at airport or something when someone didn't pay too much attention or didn't know the language. Um, so, this is happens when you send it to the simple text. So, we need to figure out, okay, this is some uh, sequence of characters that we need to send to complex. And then here at complex it looks like this, and this is sort of the intended result. But you can, even, you can see it even in, um, <coughs> in, in like Latin text. Here you have an example of this more ornamental font lobster, and you see there's no joints here. Between the, between the individual glyphs uh, if you send it through simple text. Or if you send it to, through complex text, you get these ligatures between the various glyphs. So that's the intended result. And here, typographic features are enabled. So the font has tables and sort of rules for how a certain <coughs> excuse me, characters are to be combined. And in the simple text, these are not taken into account and just sort of stamped next to each other. Um, so you can see there's a variety of differences. So going into the um, architecture a little bit, in the simple path, uh, I, I'm going to explain the optimization. <coughs> so on the CSS of the page, let's say you have 
uh, a font stick here, a lobster, or sans serif, and you have this piece of um, an Arabic string. So you go through the sequence, and for each of the characters, you try to find a glyph. So uh, you try to translate it to the glyph ID of the font, and then you come out where do I draw this, and which glyph do I draw. And the optimization data structure is called glyph page tree. And you, come, you go in with the first character and you go to that tree and you try to find coverage for your particular um, character. Now the glyph page tree is, is separated into each, I think, 256 um, character lookup pages. And um, so first you identify which kind of page you need to look into and then you, you try to find out uh, by which font in my stack is this, or which font in my stack covers this. So then, in the Arabic case, we don't find it in Lobster and say like we're on a, um, on a system that's configured to English, then even the sans serif font doesn't have a glyph for it, so we, we sort of traverse to the fallback font, ask font config on Linux for um, a fallback font for this case, and we come back with a font that can render Arabic. And the, the glyph page tree is a caching data structure, so it's sort of kept alive with information about which glyphs have been used and um, where is the availability. So in a way, so when we do the same with like the string like lobster here, um, with one example here, here's this sort of E with the sedilla and rev again. In the lobster we don't find coverage for this, so we end up finding fallback point only for this glyph. And then um, we have information about all the glyphs and the, which font covers them, and we have information about their um, advanced width. So just a sort of horizontal displacement. So in the complex path, we get full shaping. But that means we don't have these kind of issues with the Arabic showing only isolated glyphs. In the simple path, we get sort of an optimization, but at the cost of certain sort of visual um, yeah, breakages in a way. <coughs> so comparing these two again, in the simple path, we have a typewriter style glyph selection, and we're just sort of placing them horizontally. In complex path, we have full shaping and contextual glyph selection, that means the <coughs> glyphs are selected correctly. In the simple path, we have horizontal advances only, that means we just need to sort of vary the, the x coordinate. In the complex path, we can have 2D glyph placement. So that means the shaping result can mean you have to place this sort of vertically on top, or sometimes even sort of reverse the order of glyphs. In the simple path, there is not really control over typographic features. That means these open type features cannot be enabled um, because of the nature of this optimization. In the complex path, there is full typographic feature support. So the shaping um, library half bus that we're using handles these open type features for us. The simple path fails on scripts that require contextual shaping, so it does not support all languages. And uh, in the complex part, we have comprehensive script and language support. And as I mentioned before, the other really, from a sort of maintenance point of view, the other really big um, difficulty is that if you have two code paths, simple and complex, then you get subtle bugs when users complain like, this doesn't look right. And you notice often that it doesn't look right because it's not going to the complex part while it should. So you have these issues like deciding when to use complex part and when not and that things effectively look different in the two paths. Like they might have slightly different spacing or sometimes wrong glyph selection and this kind of thing. So it's a, it's a sort of really tricky and painful to maintain. So coming to the uh, recent improvements in text and layout, in Blink we're switching to complex text only. So we're going to get rid of the simple path. Uh, altogether. In, in um, Chrome uh, M48, um, we have it enabled as under like experimental web features. So if you have a 48 beta, you can go to Chrome Flags and switch on experimental web features, then all text goes through the complex path. 
all the time. In 49, the plan is to have it um, default enabled. Now, I mentioned that the complex text class, or the simple text class, <coughs> is in fact an optimization to sort of improve performance. And if we've carefully looked at performance when doing this. And one um, means of keeping the performance up is to have a word cache that helps with keeping some of the sort of interim results of doing text shaping. Uh, the other improvement we do is shaper-driven segmentation, and I'll explain in more detail what that is, and improving font fallback and specification work in improvements in CSS writing modes and fonts. So switching to complex text, um, so we're going to get rid of this whole class of rendering different bugs between simple and complex text. We have Unicode, uh, sorry, we have unified code. We have Unicode already. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and advanced typography is always available. So features like kerning um, and swashes and ornamental things, this, this is available. And the complex script language has become a first class citizen. Like we always. Um, when doing changes, we will always take into account how does it affect um, languages that require complex shaping. But full shaping is more costly and we have to avoid performance regressions and that's why we introduced the word cache. So just quickly, the concept of a word cache is similar to this. It's a bit more complex in the code. However, if you want to shape this piece of um, uh, example text and or you want to do layout on it, then you need to know the length, then you need to find the breaks, where you can do a line break, uh, and so on. So what you can, could do is, of course, you measure the whole thing, find out it's too long if you want to break at this position, and find the next previ uh, like the previous break, measure this, it's still too long until you come here maybe, and you, you can find out that after the sit, you want to you do a line break. Now, doing this kind of iterative process, you notice that sort of the previous parts are measured over and over again. Um, and in a way, that's redundant work. So what the word cache does and, um, is basically finding all the space characters or break opportunities and separating the text by that. And then doing when you do measurements for layout, the result is basically the uh, the addition of or the sum of like all the, the lengths of these words plus the length of the space characters in between of, written between them. So you save a lot of redundant work by not measuring whole substrings again, but just as um, sort of uh, composing the result from the entries that you already have in the word cache. <coughs> So things like doing a window resize or rotating your phone will become much faster because you don't have to do all these um, line layout measurements, but you can synthesize these results from the word cache. So the word cache helps with font operations like width, uh, measurements and drawing and selection quite drastically. And this way we can keep the performance up while uh, getting rid of the simple text part. Then I mentioned shaper-driven segmentation, and that's, uh, the, let's say the, that might not be so intuitive from the name of it. So um, segmentation is, is a process that needs to be done before you can hand off a piece of text to the shaper. So because of the, um, the formula that we saw at the beginning, um, you can only shape a piece of text when you when all the other things like the the font, the size, um, the text and the context, and the, the features and the script and the language when all of these are constant. So the shaper cannot handle mm, like multiple uh, values of this. So you need to break your text into piece, sub pieces of the text where all of these variables are context. So, uh, sorry, constant. For this, you need to segment the text. And uh, I mentioned one of the things that needs to be constant is the font. Um, and then explaining this, we need to first look at font coverage again. Um, here we have uh, font coverage and font fallback. So here we have a bunch of example fonts, Kochi, Minchu, 
Lohit Devanagari, Sun Serif as a, as Arial in this case, um, Apple Color Emoji, and Giza Pro. This one is the sort of axis of, of, of possible Unicode code points. And you see each of these fonts, it's not exactly to scale, but maybe uh, just an indication. So each of these fonts has coverage in a certain Unicode range area or in multiple. And it's a little bit similar to this optimization that I was talking about before. So for font fallback for a piece of text, we need to figure out what are, <coughs> for, sort of, for each of the, this parts of this text, we need to identify the font coverage. And this process is called font fallback. So here, for this piece of text ABC, we can go down and find out, OK, we have coverage for this in Arial, so we can render this in Arial. Here's a bit of Chinese text. We go through this. Ko Chi Minh Shu has coverage for this, indicated by the yellow color. Um, for this piece of Hindi text, we find out Lohit Devanagari has coverage. And for these emojis, Apple color emoji has them. And for this piece of Arabic text, we find that this is <coughs> covered by Giza Pro. Now, we could do this segmentation by font before shaping, but that leads to certain issues. This is the sort of before what we did. And this basically means we, for each of the characters in our input stream, we go into this optimization structure and find a result and basically for each of those characters then we have an, a result we can render it in this font. However, that leads to certain issues. <coughs> um, and I'll explain these. So the, the new approach is different. In the, in the new approach we do a segmentation stage not by font initially but by script <coughs> and by a, two other characteristics, but they don't play such a big role here. So we have a run segmentation stage that first of all looks only at script. And then we do shaping with it, and then we get results from the shaper about font coverage, and then we only do font fallback. So um, for this piece, we start with, because it's like, it belongs to one script because the emojis are resolved to be the same script as this. We start by trying to shape it with Mincho. Mincho has zero coverage for this, um, so we do font fallback. Then we use the Logit font, which has coverage for this, so this part is now shaped. And, um, and this part is not shaped by Logit because the emojis are missing. So we have a partial result, and we still shape um, the emoji. So we go next to the next fallback font and can render this um, uh, with the emoji font. So the difference again is we don't do the font lookup before, but we do the font lookup um, sort of once we have the results from shaping. And so why does this matter uh, from a sort of user's perspective? So what we we had an interesting work report here. Someone implemented something like an on-screen virtual keyboard for entering these characters with um, combining marks on them. And turns out what you do, what happens when you do like per character lookup, is you find one result for the first, for the base character, and then you, you may find a different result for the combining mark. So when you select one of those here and look at it in the uh, web inspector and dev tools, then you find that it's rendered with two fonts, times and finals. And the combining goes wrong. <coughs> so the combining mark is sort of placed slightly to the right and something goes wrong. And this is an artifact of doing this kind of per character glitch selection. Because when you scan forward and scan for the fonts first, segment and then do shaping, you cannot fix this issue. So it gets mixed up like this. You have um, a base character and sort of combining marks that sort of are slightly placed on the contour of the base character, or it doesn't really align with the base character at all. And this is the sort of result afterwards. Um, now all the combining marks are placed correctly and the right font is selected for drawing each of them. 
And that's, um, this process is called graphene cluster-based font uh, selection and fallback. So when there is a web font specified, like Tynos, and it doesn't have a combining mark, we don't attempt <coughs> to use the web font, but we go to the font fallback for the whole graphene cluster. And uh, this is how we sort of achieve a better result. So then we have like the right kind of combining marks and they are sort of correctly aligned with the base character. And what we, with this new approach, with the um, graphene cluster based font selection and fallback, you can also gain improvements um, for shaping across font fallback. So this used to be the result before, if I sort of cut the font into multiple pieces, I introduce breakage among the sort of uh, breakage across the font coverage boundaries. So if I need to shape this with different fonts, then we have this issue that here um, we have the sort of initial and, and uh, terminal glyph selected and uh, this sort of Arabic um, continuation breaks. Um, what we get with the new approach is that even when we even when these parts of the text are different fonts, we can still sort of get continuous or better um, continuous display. So this was the um, these were the improvements on simple versus complex and um, shaper driven segmentation. Uh, now to the last part that is <coughs> specification work um, in the area of CSS font matching improvements. So um, Blink and WebKit, I believe, still has this problem, um, had a problem of not following the CSS font matching algorithm correctly. <coughs> so we, for example, were not doing font matching correctly for the stretch property, and also we did not follow this algorithm of the CSS fonts module in the right order. <coughs> so sometimes we would end up at selecting the wrong font, at least, uh, at least according to the specification. Um, so that's, uh, this has been improved and the algorithm was kind of re-implemented in the Then we have a variety of um, improvements in CSS writing mode. <coughs> so there is um, several fixes to the specification and the specification has been pushed to um, candidate recommendation and our pass rate on the writing modes test has improved as well. So uh, to sum it up, we are switching to complex text for everything. Um, we developed a word cache to mitigate sort of the performance pressure and um, we're doing shaper driven segmentation for fallback and sort of font selection improvements. <coughs> and we have a couple of uh, spec compliance improvements in writing modes and font style matching. Future plans are <coughs> once we're shipping the uh, complex only or complex by default version, um, we are going to get rid of the simple parts. That means we're going to remove uh, glyph page tree nodes and glyph page tree and simple shaper and link. Um, we still have work to do in improving fallback um, for sort of arriving at the right font for displaying punctuation, for example, and emojis. Um, we're trying to improve testability of font fallback, which is a bit of a tricky issue because you have different bot configurations and so on, and the system fonts are different, things like that. <coughs> and we want to improve like the hit rate and perhaps the sort of memory consumption of the word cache. And that is it for my talk. I'm happy to take questions. So, how does performance compare in the end with the caching and everything you've done? Too? Yeah, so um, we have a bunch of um, performance tests, um, <coughs> for example, a rapid line layout and a few others. Um, what we see overall, looking at the for example, we also have one performance test for rendering the full HTML5 one page specification, things like that. Um, <clears throat> what we see is some improvements for, um, for so, um, and we see some sort of slight regressions, like 
but overall we're confident that the um, that the correctness gains we have and the um, and the sort of um, accumulation of sort of performance results is is good enough to ship it. So in some cases we have like two to three percent regression, but we also we have like sometimes we have a 10 15 percent gain in some performance tests. Um, we would like to have better performance test coverage. Um, it's a bit difficult to extract an average of what all the users are doing with the browser, right? So, um, um, so we're trying to improve coverage and sort of indications for the performance results that we have. Actually, I'll add on the question if that's okay. Um, so, one issue is that we have for caching. We have very similar caches when you're doing rasterization, um, but usually for characters. But um, on some page, in some languages and character sets, you know, every word is a different character. Yes. Yes, that's right. So we <clears throat> we account for that by not using the word cache in all cases, um, and we have the word cache is split into one that is for whole words, and actually for, <coughs> for example, for um, CJK text, we have a separate sort of part of the word cache that just caches <coughs> single glyph results, and um, and that's how we use it in, in CJK. <coughs> Any more questions? I have another question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, did you... You mentioned Tarkos, but are you also doing this for uh, Mac and um, Windows as well? Uh, we use <coughs> we use Harpers everywhere now. Oh, okay. Um, so that was a in a way we found this important as a sort of precondition. It's not technically really a precondition, but um, we we worked on having a unified shaping on all platforms before um, before switching to this. Um, <coughs> So yeah, we do ha use HalfPass everywhere, with one limitation that on Mac, uh, the, some of the system fonts are um, Apple Advanced Typography fonts, and HalfPass has no native support for it. So in some cases, HalfPass has a layer of um, communicating with Cortex for certain sort of glyph properties, and um, and being able to render <coughs> complex fonts or sort of complex text on Mac using AAT fonts, because it's important to support this kind of default set of fonts that is installed on the system. Yeah, thanks. All right, um, if you have more questions later, oh, you have one. Oh, no, no. I just wanted to laugh. <laughs> 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 then uh, just feel free to grab me. Yeah. Thank you.